Welcome to part three on our series of videos for NSF career grants. Uh, this video is entitled Eight Principles for Readable Writing. Eight principles for readable writing. Work hard in your submission to implement them. And here they are. First, use transitions and echo words. In other words, you want to use transitions to connect concepts within your sentences and use the same words, same terms, what we call echoing, for key concepts. Don't switch terms for variety. Pick the terms you want to use and stick to them throughout. Sequence old to new. What that means is you want to orient your readers with old, previously introduced concepts before you reveal any new ones. Avoid starting sentences with ideas that come out of nowhere. Next, sequence light to heavy. What does that mean? When you construct a sentence, you want a short subject, a light subject, followed by the key verb and then all the heavy information afterwards. The key verb should be as close to the beginning of the sentence as possible. Four, strong verbs. You want to use them. Explain actions in verbs, not nouns. Avoid what we call nominalizations. They hide real verbs, and we'll explain that when we get to this point. Rely primarily on the active voice, so passive voice is fine. Next, be concise, cut words. In other words, eliminate unnecessary words. Test the cuts you make by asking, if these words are gone, is the meaning different or incomplete? If the answer is no, they are candidates to cut. Six, signal an enumerated list. Tell your reader how many list items are coming before you list them, especially for lists with three items or more. Seven, attach demonstrative pronouns to nouns. You want to avoid isolated pronouns, this, that, these, and those. They are often ambiguous with an unclear antecedent. You want to always pair those this, that, these, and those with nouns. And then finally, break up strings of prepositional phrases. Don't pile up phrases with of, to, in, for, over, around, etc. No more than three prepositional phrases in a sentence or an independent clause. Let's take a look at these principles in turn. Use transitions and echo words. The key for flow, logical flow, is the use of good transitions, words that logically link supporting sentences in a paragraph. You have a topic sentence at the beginning of the paragraph and a whole series of supporting sentences that follow on. The topic sentence sets the stage. It defines the subject of the paragraph. And logical flow is created by transition words that link one sentence to the next. So how do you choose the right transition words? First, you need to determine the conceptual category that connects sentences and then select the proper words and phrases. And here they are, here are the transition categories, adding to, showing sequence, contrasting, showing cause and effect, providing examples, showing similarity, and all the transition words that are associated with those transition categories. They are very useful words and a lot of people sometimes want to cut them, but they serve an important purpose to link sentences together and create flow. Let's look at this paragraph without good transitions. First, we'll read it aloud. Recent advances in the field of visual prosthesis, as showcased in the special feature of the Journal of Neural Engineering, have led to promising results from clinical trials of a number of devices. As noted by these articles, there are many challenges involved in assessing vision of people with profound vision loss. It is important that there is consistency in the methodology and reporting standards for clinical trials of visual prosthesis and the broader vision restoration research. Now, this is a fine paragraph in terms of the grammar and the sentence structure, but it's missing the transitions to establish the relationships between sentences. Can you see where they might help those transitions? Let's see how.
Let's look at this paragraph. It doesn't have good transitions. First, we'll read it aloud. Molecular self-assembly, or building from the bottom up, is increasingly being recognized as the next step in the development of novel biomaterials. Researchers have begun investigating the utility of self-assembling polymers and peptides in the field of tissue engineering. Peptides have several advantages over polymers, including versatility in composition, chemical properties, and morphology. Polymer scaffolds typically include just one or two different biological ligands on their surfaces as binding areas because it's difficult to control the concentration and arrangement of these ligands. Peptides offer the ability to easily synthesize different ligand sequences with different properties that can then be combined to form self-assembled scaffolds. Peptides can be designed to form gel structures under physiological conditions. Now again, a perfectly reasonable paragraph in many ways, grammatically correct, there are no real grammatical mistakes, but it's not good enough because it doesn't have the transitions that it needs. Can you see where transitions might help? Let's see how. We need transitions before the words at the numbered points. What might be good transition words or phrases? Take a moment. Do you see the possibilities? Now we add our transition words. See how easily you can follow the logic of the paragraph? Molecular self-assembly, building from the bottom up, is increasingly being recognized. For example, uh -huh, researchers have been investigating the utility of self-assembling polymers and peptides. However, peptides have several advantages over polymers. Polymer scaffolds typically include just one or two different biological ligands. In contrast, peptides offer the ability to easily synthesize different ligand sequences. Moreover, peptides can be designed to form gel structures under physiological conditions. Again, the transitions are signals. They establish the relationship between concepts. Let's take a look. Why do these transitions work? They send the right conceptual signals to the reader. The writer knows the purpose of every sentence. The first sentence is a general context statement, kind of sets the stage. But we transition to two specific instances, two specific examples, and they're treated equally. But they are different. That's why we have the contrast. Peptides have several advantages over polymers, so we signal that difference. Now we signal the key reason at the end why one is better than the other. And then finally, we conclude by adding another advantage. We could also use the phrase in addition instead of the word moreover. Everything coheres. We have a coherent paragraph that uses transition words to link those key concepts. You want to use echo words and logical change to reinforce the no new contract from each sentence that looks behind and each sentence that looks ahead. When it looks behind, the sentence has to connect back to what's gone before, what the reader already knows, and you need to know how it does this. You need to ask yourself then, how can I revise this sentence to make the connection more explicit? And each sentence looks ahead. What expectations does the sentence raise in the audience's mind? And does the text ahead fulfill those expectations? And how can I revise the sentence to manage the reader's expectations? Variety, synonyms, different phrases to describe the same thing? Never. Keep things consistent. So an absence of echo words, the use of the same terms for the same things, makes reading this passage a bit problematic. Here, the writer changes terms when identical words would be better. So I'll read that aloud again. Hist histological examination of biological medical specimens has gained its universality and undisputed significance through distinct staining techniques and mic microscopical evaluation. Discrimination of tissue types after specific staining and labeling is an essential prerequisite for histopathological investigation, for example, an accurate diagnosis of cancer. 
Histochemical staining techniques can only be used in a targeted manner for known compounds, and only a limited number of such targets can be visualized from the given sample at the same time. Another limitation of classical histology lies in the fact that a considerable amount of experience is required and that even well-trained pathologists often interpret histologically stained sections differently. Again, a paragraph that's grammatically fine. But watch, we talk about specimens. Oh, we also talk about tissue types. Oh, now we talk about a sample. Are we talking about specimens, a sample, or a specific kind of sample? What are we doing? Are we evaluating? Are we labeling? Are we visualizing? Are we interpreting? We're shifting our terms around. Now a revision. Note how this revision applies to consistent terminology throughout and employs useful transition words. Histological examination of tissue and interpretation with visualization. It's a special kind of interpretation. Tissue types, visualization. Ah, but histostemical staining techniques have two limitations and then we signal a list. First, the techniques can only be used in a targeted manner. Oh, and by the way, the targets are visualized and we visualize a given tissue sample. Second, we enumerate again, interpreting a histochemically stained tissue requires a considerable amount of expertise and even well-trained pathologists often interpret histologically stained sections differently. Consistent terms applied consistently. That makes a much better paragraph. Again, make your paragraphs a pyramid, topic sentence at the point, with all the supporting sentences linked by logic, transitions, and echo words. Topic sentence at the top sets the stage, defines the subject of the paragraph, and all the follow-on sentences are logical. They create flow using transitions and echo words. Okay, let's take a look at a well-constructed paragraph. We looked at some ones that were not as well-constructed, but this is very well-constructed. First, we'll read it aloud. Transformation is one of the key mechanisms in which bacteria are capable of DNA transfer. Transformation refers to the mechanism by which bacteria uptake naked DNA from the environment across their cell membranes and incorporate it into their genomes. This mechanism of DNA acquisition often has significant implications whereby bacteria are able to pick up and acquire advantageous traits like antibiotic resistance. Some bacteria, like Bacillus subtilis, are naturally capable of transformation and are regarded as genetically competent. E. coli, however, is a bacterial species that is not capable of undergoing natural transformation and so requires some sort of artificial intervention to perform this process. The treatment of non-competent cultures like E. coli with a chemical or physical agents can prevent the uptake of DNA via the induction of artificial competence under laboratory conditions. Watch the logical flow of this paragraph. The paragraph's topic sentence sets the stage and follow-on sentences support each with a specific purpose. Topic sentence. Transformation is one of the key mechanisms which bacteria are capable of DNA transfer. Signals the paragraph subject. Next sentence, transformation refers to the mechanism. It defines and elaborates on the topic. Next sentence, this mechanism of DNA acquisition often has significant implications, it pinpoints the implications of the topic. It's all about bacteria able to pick up and acquire traits. Next sentence, fourth and fifth sentences, they give two examples of the topic in a compare and contrast juxtaposition. And then finally, the last sentence concludes with an additional elaboration that logically connects with the previous sentence. The entire paragraph has topic focus. Every sentence has a purpose. Every sentence serves a function. And you as a writer should recognize how each sentence serves a function. Echo words. We use echo words consistently. We don't change our terms. 
Transformation is the topic of the paragraph. Mechanism is what transformation is. Natural and artificial, they're the types of transformation. Competent and non-competent, a term for the capability of uptaking DNA. And of course, we use the word uptake. That verb is used to convey the key element in the process. Consistent terminology all the way through. It is not repetitive. It echoes. The use of these echo words make the paragraph easy for the reader to process mentally. They help establish the logical connections. Now let's look at how the first paragraph connects to the second. Okay, does that work? Well, we can do better. So the last sentence reads of the first paragraph, the treatment of non-competent cultures like E. coli with chemical or physical agents can permit the uptake of DNA via the induction of artificial competence under laboratory conditions. Ultrasound has been identified. Hey, ultrasound comes out of nowhere. Okay. Here we apply the concept of echoing and old to new. We end the first paragraph with the induction of artificial competence. One novel technique to induce artificial competence is ultrasound. So the new concept comes after the older concept of artificial competence competence. Okay. Now we have a slight change at the bottom of the paragraph where it says progress in the understanding of bacterial genetics is dependent on the availability and development of transformational methods such as ultrasound. Okay. So that paragraph is all about ultrasound. So it has paragraph focus, but it didn't have the transition from the old paragraph to the new paragraph to really make the connection explicit. You want to orient your readers with old, previously introduced concepts before revealing any new concepts. So you want to do this. All experiments will be conducted with stromal cells isolated from normal endometrium and diseased endometriotic tissue. The tissue will be obtained under informed consent under a protocol reviewed by the Institutional Review Board. So we ended the first sentence with tissue and began the next sentence with tissue. So we introduced a concept and we oriented with that old concept before we introduced the new concept of informed consent. But what you don't want to do is this. All experiments will be conducted with stromal cells isolated from normal endometrium and diseased endometriotic tissue. Informed consent will be obtained. We end with tissue like we did in the first sentence, but we begin with a totally new concept that comes out of nowhere. And we don't get to the older concept until we come to the end of the paragraph. Again, orient your readers with old previously introduced concepts before revealing new concepts in subsequent sentences. So where is the old to new problem in this paragraph? Take a moment and read it. Do you see it? Of course, it's the cyclic load and micro motion that comes out of nowhere. Hmm. What is the concept that connects both sentences? Can you see it? It's the modular junction. The modular junction between the trunnion of the femoral stem and the corresponding taper of the femoral head exists in almost all THR designs. Within the modular junction, so we begin the second sentence with that older idea before we get to the newer idea of cyclic load and micromotion. We have an explicit echoing of the older concept. Can you see the old and new problems in this paragraph? Take a moment to read it. You see it now, don't you? There it is. The adaptive immune response it comes out of nowhere. It's very fixable. 
Oh, by the way, here's a noun hiding a verb, production of. Now look at the changes we make. We did a little grammatical fix. Discriminating harmless environmental products from serious threats is an enormous challenge for intestinal mucosa, which is constantly exposed to foreign substances derived from both food and commensal microbiota. To control such exposure, because that's a really good connection, because that's what we talked about in the previous sentence, the idea of mucosa being constantly exposed. To control such exposure, the adaptive immune response produces, we use that verb, or uses T regulatory cells in the mucosa. So we solve the old to new problem right there. We have a good echoing and we now make production of verb. But we need another verb for the second part of what the adaptive immune response does. All right, next idea, sequence light to heavy. Use a short subject, a light subject, a succinct subject in every one of your sentences, followed as closely as possible by the verb and all the heavy information at the end. So if we say a two by two by two factorial analysis provides three benefits, benefit one, benefit two, benefit three, and those benefits could be lengthy in terms of the number of words on the page, that works fine. But if we have benefit one, blah, 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 benefit two, blah, 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 benefit three, blah, blah, blah. We have no, I know it takes forever to get the verb. We have no idea how we should think about those benefits, right? Are the three benefits. So the verb's too far down in that kind of structure and all the light information is at the end. Better to flip the sentence to make sure that the light information and the verb are as close as possible. So we have a rule of thumb here no more than 12 to 15 words before the sentence's key verb. If you're at 15, 16 words, you're pushing the envelope. Keep your subjects short as possible. So take a look at this um, passage and its revision at the top. After institutional review board approval, 10 patients, two boys and eight girls, mean age 13.3 years, from the existing outpatient clinic of J. Richard Bowen, MD, at the Alfred I. DuPont Hospital for Children, agreed to participate in the study. Whoa, it takes forever to get to the verb. Better to break it into two sentences, perhaps, to make sure that the verbs are close to the beginning of each of those sentences. After institutional review board, 10 patients, two boys and eight girls, mean age 13 years, agreed to participate in the study. Agreed, it's much closer to the beginning of the sentence. Participants came from the existing outpatient clinic of J. Richard Bowen, etc. Participants came, nice, short subject, close on verb, much easier to read, much faster to read. Where's the key verb in this sentence? How can we get it closer to the beginning of the sentence? Take a moment to read it. Can you find that key verb? It's not who were administered, it's showed. How can we get it closer to the beginning of the sentence? Ah, older people showed a remarkable improvement in their immune system when administered a drug that zeroes in on a genetic signaling pathway associated with immune function and aging. This way we get the verb three words in to the beginning of the sentence. Much better light to heavy. Next principle. Explain action and verbs, not noun. Use strong verbs. Rely primarily on the active voice. Can we identify the real actors and real actions in this sentence? Attempts were made on the part of the PT staff in regard to the assessment of poor patient outcomes. So we know who's acting, don't we? The PT staff attempted to assess the poor patient outcomes or poor patient outcomes were assessed by the PT staff. That's a passive voice construction. But either one is much better than the original because we don't know who's doing what to whom. You want to explain action in verbs, not nouns, and you want to rely primarily on the active voice. But it's important to understand the characteristics of passive voice. It's about who's doing what to whom. In active voice, the actor acts. In passive voice, the actor is acted upon. 
And passive voice has three essential grammatical elements. First, it uses a transitive verb. That is a verb that takes an object. A verb that doesn't take an object is called intransitive. Sleep is an intransitive verb. You would never say, I slept the hotel. That's goofy. You would say, I slept at the hotel or I slept poorly. The second characteristic of a passive voice is it uses the past participle form. And in English, the regular marker for a past participle is ed. But we have irregular verbs in English as in other languages like take, took, or taken. And then finally, it has a form of the verb to be. BM is our was, were, been, being. And there are other words that surround the passive voice that have to do with tense and number and person and so forth. But these are the three key grammatical characteristics. So for example, the following advantages are provided by this new model. So the transitive verb in past participle form is provided and we have a form of the verb to be are. This, by the way, is not passive voice. There are four advantages to the model. That is not passive. Note, passive voice has nothing to do with tense. You can have any tense in passive voice, even though passive always uses the past participle. Active, Keller managed the project. The project was managed by Keller. Keller will, will manage the project. The project will be managed by Keller. Past participle every time. Now the traditional justification for active voice is it pinpoints the actor and makes the actor accountable. So the classic kind of passive weasel voice phrasing is mistakes were made. However, the passive voice is in the language for a reason. It serves a purpose. And in fact, there are instances where passive voice is not only better, but it's required. Let's take a look at those three instances. Now, passive voice works well in three instances. First is you don't or you can't know who did something. The post-amputation infection was discovered in the patient's last examination. If you don't know who did it, maybe it doesn't even matter. Next, you want to emphasize the result, not who did the action. And this is the science reason. Here's a non-science example, but the principle still applies. The staff was trained on infection monitoring. The staff, staff will be trained on infection monitoring. It's not important who did the training. It's, what's more important is that the staff was in fact trained or it will be trained. Third reason is you'd violate the old to new principle by using active voice. Old to new is more important than passive versus active. In fact, it trumps everything. Thus, you'd say poor prosthetic fit can cause infection. Infection can be controlled temporarily by debriding. Or poor prosthetic fit can cause infection, which can be controlled temporarily by debriding. But you would never say or never write poor prosthetic fit can cause infection. Debriding can temporarily control infection. Debriding comes out of nowhere. Better to begin with an older concept and use passive voice. In your world of scientific research, you can make the system, the process, the methodology, the actor, and then get to active voice. For example, the following advantages are provided by the therapeutic intervention. Why not make the therapeutic intervention the subject of the sentence? The therapeutic intervention provides the following advantages. Then you need to find the right verb. Get the verb that is close to the beginning of a sentence as possible, but pick a good verb. The experiment revealed, the analysis showed. Um, see how that works? So all these verbs are available to you given the particular context in which you're writing. So make the system, the process, the methodology, the actor, and then you can get to active voice. Another part of using strong verbs, you wanna fight the nominalizations. We call them the zombie nouns. Okay? And you can see in on the left-hand column here, the um, examples of nominalizations, and then the verb forms, the infinitive form, or the ing form, the gerund form. They're often called zombie nouns because the joke is they're verbs that have been killed and brought back to life as nouns. <laughs> so actions are better expressed as verbs or verb forms rather than nouns. Although, again, these words are in the language for a reason, they do serve a purpose. And you can recognize um, nominalizations by their suffixes typically, A-N-C-E, E-N-C-E, I-O-N, M-E-N-T, although their words, as you know, last two rows below, 
that don't have those standard suffixes, but they're also nominalizations. Do you see the nominalization in this sentence? Can we get rid of it? We can. Take a moment, read it. You see where it is? Right. It's in the maintenance of how intestinal intestinal epithelial VDR is involved in the maintenance of. You know what the verb form of maintenance is? Right. However, how intestinal epithelial VDR maintains microbial homeostasis and immunity through panacells remains largely unknown. Now, some people might object to that because it seems awfully conclusive, but there are ways around that too. What if you think epithelial VDR is one of many possible causes? You can make a construction like this. However, how intestinal epithelial VDL, VDR helps maintain microbial homeostasis and innate immunity. So now it's just a part of the function of maintaining microbial homeostasis. Fifth principle, be concise. Aim to cut at least 10% of your words. And as you know, with the page requirements on the NSF career grant, as well as other grants, every word's precious. Make every word count. Check your words for precision. Success of this proposal depends on the accurate results of viral protein modeling. No, this proposal success depends on accurate viral protein modeling. The word results is redundant. We don't need that. Right? And this proposal's success, okay? and we get rid of, of this, lead with this proposal's success. So eliminate your wordy phrases. You can Google and see dozens of them. You wanna change at this point in time to now. So it is our opinion that to we believe at the present time than now or currently, in the event that if, simple two letter word, change by means of, to, through, or simply by. So watch out for your wordy phrases. They are candidates for cutting. Opt for active voice wherever possible, since passive voice is often wordier. So here's wordier passive voice. Several software tools and processes customized specifically for this proposal are used in our research approach. How about this? Our approach uses customized software tools and processes. Look at how many words we cut. Cut the itses, you've seen them. It is known, it is understood. These are candidates for cutting. Relative pronouns, who, what, which, are also candidates. Look at the first sentence. It is essential, we have an itses, that we identify interventions to delay or mitigate frailty in ESRD patients who are waiting for kidney transplantation. Oh, we must or we need to, much more direct and active, identify interventions to delay or mitigate frailty in ESRD patients waiting that who are can be eliminated for a kidney transplant. Notice we've changed that nominalization to a direct noun. Next principle, number six, signal enumerated lists. You want to tell your reader how many list items are coming before you list them. So at the top here, we have two acronyms that represent two concepts. And here is the opening of this discussion. Despite the increased risk for and the severe consequences of memory loss, we identified only three interventions that examine the impact of CCT. Now, what we expect to see is a discussion of these three, just these three, Oh no, that's not what happens because there are two interventions in addition that examine the impact of physical activity. So, okay, is that it? Are we done? Oh no, <laughs> there's one more. And one intervention that examined the impact of combined CCT and PA versus PA only. Okay. So we have three categories of studies, one for CCT, three for CCT, excuse me, two for PA, and one that combined both. So how many studies do we actually have? Well, we have six studies. And we need to have a more complete introductory sentence that signals the number before we address each of the studies in turn. 
Despite the increased risk for and the severe consequence of memory loss, we identify only six studies that address CCT and PA and their effects on cognitions in adults with CBD. Colon, then we get our list. And the list sums up to six. Three interventions on impact of CCT, two interventions on the impact of PA, and one intervention that examined both. You must signal your enumerated list so readers know how many items are coming. Principle number seven, attach demonstrative pronouns to nouns. We have a number of different pronoun types in English as in other languages. We have personal pronouns, he, she, they, we. We have impersonal pronouns, it. We have relative pronouns, who, what, which. And we also have demonstrative pronouns, this, that, these, and those. If they're isolated and unattached, they're often ambiguous. So a good rule to follow is always pair them with nouns. Here we have a passage. We have three unattached theses. To what do they refer? First one, McKimbin actuators have many benefits, including low weight, high force weight ratio, and flexibility. These have been attached to an ankle foot. What does these refer to? Third sentence down. Unfortunately, these have poor bandwidth. Again, what does these refer to? Then the last these. Motors, by contrast, are fast and accurate, yet have a poor force weight ratio. These are dealt with. What does these refer to in that final sentence? Hmm. Well, the first one is probably actuators, right? These actuators have been attached. Okay. And the third sentence is also actuators too, most likely. Unfortunately, actuators have poor bandwidth compared to human capability. The last one though, it's tricky. Motors by contrast are fast and accurate, yet have a poor force to weight ratio. These issues are dealt with differently in two motorized knee orthosis, but we're guessing on what the noun is that should be attached to the these. So our view is always attach a noun to your this, that, theses, and thoses. Uh, they become a different part of speech, by the way, when that happens, they become a demonstrative adjective. But don't isolate your this, that, these, and thoses. Always attach a noun. Final principle, principle number eight. Break up strings of prepositional phrases. Prepositions serve a very important function in the language. They're connective tissue between concepts. You need to use them wisely and sparingly in each sentence. So prepositions have many functions. There are prepositions of space, time, possession, agency, cause, contrast, source, manner, and rate. By is a very common preposition. It's a preposition of space, time, agency, and manner. It serves all those functions. But typically, prepositions fall into three uses that you can remember by the engine additive acronym, STP, space, time, and possession. Here's some examples. Note, like by, some can serve more than one use depending on context. So we have space, at, around, before, between, beside, time, after, before, from, on, until, and possession, among, for, of, with, without. They're very important parts of speech in the English language and other languages too, um, but you don't want to pile them up in a single sentence. So you want to avoid piling up phrases beginning with prepositions, the prepositions of, to, in, for, under, over, around, etc. It makes it very difficult for a reader to follow when we have these extended strings of prepositional phrases. So here's an example where we have five prepositional phrases in a row. A review on 920, by the attending physician, of the 20 prosthetic limbs, for correct fit, concluded that 14 of the prosthesis had the correct fit and six did not. Wow. Reader loses track because a review of prosthetic limbs are not close to one another and they have to wade through these prepositional phrases to get to the key ideas. Better to say this, on 920, the attending physician reviewed 20 prosthetic limbs for correct fit. Two prepositional phrases in one sentence. The attending physician concluded that 14 prostheses had the correct fit and six did not. So we've gone from five prepositional phrases in one sentence to one sentence that only has two.
So breaking the previous sentence into two sentences plus turning the noun review into a verb makes the sentence much, much easier to process. And note how review and prosthetic limb are close to one another. So what do you do to apply these principles? We have a seven step paramedic method to improve your prose. Make sure you do steps five and six with paper. One, do a global search for all your nominalization suffix, I-O-N, A-N-C, E-N-C, et cetera, replace with verbs where appropriate. Do a global search for the forms of the verb to be, B-M, is, are, was, word, been, being, and the helping verbs have, has, had. So for example, if you see the structure like this, is, was, to, verb, is designed to solve, consider using the infinitive verb solve as the real verb. If the structure is passive, consider changing the active. Do a global search for of, in, to, for, through, over, under, around. Examine the sentences they are in. Do you have a prepositional phrase pileup that is greater than three phrases per sentence? Fix it, which may mean using multiple but shorter sentences. Do a global search for it. Fix the its is. It is known. It is understood. Those are candidates for cutting. Then print out your document. Circle every key verb in every sentence, and then count the number of words before the verb. If the count exceeds 15, you are not light to heavy. You are heavy to light. Rewrite or break into two sentences. Revise in your file. Print out another copy. Check for any old to new problems looking at the beginning and endings of sentences. Fix them, which may include reverting to passive, and that's fine. Always make sure you don't violate the light to heavy principle. And then finally, spell check. If you write according to these eight principles, your writing will be easier to read. Number one, use transitions and echo words. Use transitions to connect concepts. However, therefore, as a result, for example, and use the same words and terms for the same things. Make sure you're echoing. Don't switch your terms around to have variety in your writing. Pick your terms, stick to them. Sequence old to new. Orient readers with older, previous ideas before you introduce any new ones. Avoid beginning sentences with concepts that come out of nowhere. Sequence light to heavy. Put your verb as close to the beginning of the sentence as possible. Nice short subject, nice and light, followed by the verb and all the heavy information afterwards. Use strong verbs. Explain your actions in verbs, not noun. Avoid the nominalizations, the word that ends in, ends in I-O-N, M-E-N-T, A-N-C-E, E-N-C-E. Rely primarily on the active voice. So passive voice is fine if it's used in the three ways we talked about earlier. Be concise, cut your words. Eliminate unnecessary words. You can cut 10% of your words, no problem. Test your cuts by saying, if these cuts are gone, is the meaning different or incomplete? If no, they are candidates to be cut. Signal an enumerated list. Tell your readers how many things are coming before you list them, especially for lists with three items or more. Attach demonstrative pronouns to nouns. Avoid the isolated pronouns this, that, these, and those. Always attach a noun to them. They're often ambiguous. And then finally, break up strings of prepositional phrases. Look at your sentences. If you have three or more prepositional phrases in a row, you have too many. Rearrange the sentence, get rid of the prepositional phrase, or even better, sometimes break it into two sentences. These eight principles of clear, readable prose will serve you well when you write your NSF career submission, as well as any other writing that you do, scientific writing, paper writing, professional writing, and even your emails. Again, thanks for watching.